Uh, good morning. My name is Pastor John Raymer. I have the honor of being the pastor of Grace Point Church in Mundelein. And this morning, the first Sunday after Easter, we're going to begin a new series in a letter to the church at Rome uh, called The Romans, written by the Apostle Paul. It is arguably uh, Paul's most important letter, and outside of the Gospels, has had more influence on people and the church probably than any other written document. Uh, Augustine, Luther, Wesley, just to name a few of those familiar with church history, uh, came to faith and were radically transformed uh, by the book of Romans. And of course, it was Luther's grasp of Romans as a doctor in the Catholic Church, a doctorate of theology. It was his own personal study of the book of Romans that he came to understand the wonderful truth that we are made right with God by faith in what Jesus has done for us, rather than religious efforts. Uh, we'll go more into that in a few weeks in the text. This morning, I wanna give you uh, a quick overview just for a minute or two, and then we're gonna dive in the first section. Uh, because it's 16 uh, chapters long, it's a long movement, it's a long symphony. Uh, you might think of symphonies. It's the uh, first of his 13 epistles, and the only letter or epistle that Paul wrote to a church that he'd never been to. Uh, when he wrote it in 57 AD, he'd been an apostle for 25 years, and he was on his way back to Jerusalem. The church in Rome knew of him from his other letters and conversations with individuals, and he knew of them. But it's the only church that he wrote to that he had never actually visited or founded. He intended to go, and we'll see more of that in next week. So just for a moment, we're going to get a bird's eye uh, view of it. Uh, Romans has a, a frame, a clear introduction, a clear conclusion, and four major movements in the middle. If you know classical music, uh, this might be a helpful analogy to you. Almost all symphonies that we know uh, have four major movements. Some of the early ones, yes, had three. And uh, Gustav Mahler had a couple five movement ones, well, because he was Mahler and he would do whatever he wants. Uh, but the Italian names, you might be familiar with them. The first movement is Allegro, which means cheerful or fast. And this is where all the major themes uh, of the symphony are introduced. Adagio, a slower movement, more gentle. Uh, schiazzo, which is playful, uh, usually the shortest, uh, kind of whimsical, dance-like. And then Allegro again, uh, even faster, uh, even more tempestuous, kind of like when you go to a fireworks display on the 4th of July, they save the big conclusion uh, for last. Well, this is pretty close uh, to the structure of the Book of Romans. In the next few weeks, uh, we're going to look at the introduction. You can see here the beginning of the frame, and then we will end with the conclusion at the end of our study. And in the middle, there are four movements, four very distinct sections that he is focused on. Uh, the first section from chapter 116 through 425 is salvation. How do we become right with God? How are we justified by God in Christ by grace alone, through our faith alone? And then sanctification is the second movement, chapter 5, verse 1 through 839. And that is, once we are saved, we are called a new man in Christ. Uh, no sexual connotation, men only, it's man, male, or female. Uh, once we have a relationship with God, then how does he transform us? We're told in that section that the goal of our salvation is that God is glorified by us becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. Salvation comes in a moment. Sanctification comes over time. And then thirdly, uh, chapters 9 uh, through 11, about the sovereignty of God. God had moved through the Jews, and then he was moving through the Gentiles. And the question was, what, what was God doing? And had he abandoned the Jews? Had they abandoned him? What was going on? And that's what that section is about, God's sovereign plan. And then finally, the fourth section is service to God, or God, grace applied, the grace of salvation from 12, 1 through 15, 13, in light of our salvation and God's mercy on us, what difference does it make in our life as individuals and how we relate uh, to another? So this morning, we're going to dig into the introduction. It's uh, a two-parter. Uh, today is chapter 1, 1 through 7, and next week will be verses 8 through 15, which explain more 
why Paul wrote Romans. Uh, Paul just didn't sit down and go, I've got some thoughts, I'm going to write a letter, I'll send it to a place I've never been. No, he had a very specific set of reasons, and to know the intent of the author is to have a better grasp of the meaning of the author. So we'll explore that more in detail next week. Right now I'm going to read uh, Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. I'm reading from the ESV, English Standard Version, and if you don't have a Bible, uh, they're fairly cheap on Amazon, and you can also go to esv.org, esv.org, and there's this Bible, uh, the ESV Bible, online for free, and you can follow along. So I'm going to read. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for his name's sake among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. This first section is incredibly dense. Uh, we're going to work our way uh, through it. Uh, but the overall theme here is that the gospel is for everyone, not just for Jews, Gentiles. And Gentile is the Jewish word for everybody except the Jews. So when you say Jew and Gentile, uh, you say everyone. And in this first passage, we're going to see the sender, of the letter. We're going to see the source of the letter, the subject of the letter, and then the scope of the letter. Well, the sender, I've already mentioned, the Apostle Paul. Paul was his Roman name. Saul was his Hebrew name. When he was around Jewish people, he called himself Saul. When he was around Romans and uh, non-Jews, he called himself Paul. It was very common for people to have three different names one related to their culture, and one a Roman name, and often a third. He was a brilliant, highly educated Jew. He was from Tarsus, uh, which is in now southeast uh, Turkey. Unusual for a Jew, he was a Roman citizen. In fact, his father was a Roman citizen, which was highly prized and very expensive to be a Roman citizen. He was so well educated, uh, he was uh, capable in Greek, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Latin. So born in Tarsus, raised in a strict Jewish family, but also among the culture. His father had a business and he was in the same business of leather making, tent making. And uh, so he got that experience of the Gentile, the Roman world, in his home in Tarsus. And then when he was a teenager, he moved to Jerusalem. Uh, probably sent there by his father, and he was studied under a rabbi named Gamaliel in Jerusalem. Now, Gamaliel was the shining light of, Ju of Judaism at the time, uh, of a sect called the Pharisees. And we still have uh, some of Gamaliel's writings and uh, prayers. So the sender was Paul, and most all of our letters, when we write a letter, we say, Dear so-and-so, we give the content uh, of the letter, and then we put the name of the person we're sending it to at the end. Dear Melissa, I love you. I'm having a great time. I'm on vacation. Love, John, at the end. Well, back then, letters of any length were on scrolls. So if you put your name at the bottom of the letter, so to speak, you'd have to unroll the entire scroll to see who sent it. So the common form was, the sender, the author's name was on top, then who it was to next, and then there was usually uh, just a, a simple one-line greeting. Dear Paul, to those in Rome, hope you're doing really well. Boom, and then into the content of the letter. But we don't see him say to those in Rome till verse 7. In between his introduction with his name and uh, there to whom it is, it was absolutely packed with all the statements in theology he read. The readers actually would have been astonished. This was incredibly unusual. 
Why did he give such a dense introduction to himself and bring all these theological concepts in? Well, for two reasons. Uh, they'd heard about him, but they didn't know him personally. So he was establishing a more personal connection. And second, he wanted to make clear that who he was was tied to the gospel of grace uh, that he uh, proclaimed. He was the herald announcing uh, that good news. Now, he identifies himself with two titles, two very meaningful titles, servant and apostle. The Greek word we translate servant is actually doulos, and what it really means is slave. Some of the older translations call it bond servant. And because of the emotional connotations of American slavery, we don't tend to translate the word slave. But it's not like American slavery at all. Uh, slavery in Romans' time, the vast majority of slaves, it was simply an economic transaction. Uh, you were poor, and you could get a better job by attaching yourself to a wealthy uh, Roman citizen or landowner. And uh, if you weren't hired as an employee, you became his slave. Sometimes it was for life. Uh, sometimes it was for a short period of time. Uh, the Old Testament had slavery among the Hebrew people, but only for debt. And the Old Testament law said, once you've served for six years, no matter how much your debt is, you're free and you're free to go. There was one provision in the law was that the person who was slave to the master, a fellow Jew, if they had a much better life because of that, they could voluntarily make themselves a slave for life. Uh, to that person, and so they would voluntarily attach them because on their own they might starve and not have a place. This way they had food, clothing, shelter, they had uh, a future. In the Roman Empire, some slaves were uh, those who were captured in war, no question about it, it could be very rough, but it also is true that many slaves were highly educated people. Uh, most of the teachers, the pedagogues, pe pedagogues uh, were slaves. Uh, doctors were slaves. Farmers were slaves. Uh, business managers were slaves. Uh, many Roman citizens, they would have prized slaves, and if the Roman citizen didn't have a son, uh, they would often adopt the slave as their son with full rights of inheritance. Now, Paul is calling himself a slave, a slave of God. And this isn't a new idea, because in the Old Testament, uh, Moses and David, two of the greatest men in the Old Testament, both called themselves and were called slaves of God. And the idea is this. Paul is saying, I am wholeheartedly committed to God and to doing his will, to serve him as he asked me to. He is crystal clear that Jesus Christ is his Lord and his master. The second title he uses is the word apostle, which means sent one. Uh, it was a common term uh, in the day. A sent one, an apostle, was someone who had the authority of the sendee to go do business transactions for them. We might think in modern parlance of uh, powers of attorney, power for health, power for finances, power to make contracts. Uh, the apostles, uh, the sent ones, would usually carry news. Uh, they were the communicators, no email, uh, no certain mail system. You would send a person authorized to speak to you, whether it was for a business deal or something uh, more significant. So Paul was a sent one. Uh, Jesus applied that same term uh, to his key uh, disciples. Now, 25 years before he wrote this letter, Paul was part of the sect of the Pharisees. I mentioned Gamaliel before. The Pharisees were the ultra-strict Jews. Uh, they were so strict and so proud, uh, they looked down on every other Jew. Uh, they considered them all lessers. And Gentiles, they wouldn't speak. Uh, they wouldn't talk to them. In public, uh, they would wrap their robes so tightly around themselves because if the hem of their garment touched the garment of a Gentile, they considered themselves to be impure. So Saul was raised with brilliant man with this passionate understanding 
of Judaism. He was in Jerusalem when Jesus was alive. We don't know if he saw him, uh, but he certainly was very clearly in the book of Acts around. Uh, he helped vote to put to death Stephen, one of the deacons who was stoned to death. He was absolutely convinced as a zealous Pharisee that all these Christ followers were wrong, uh, that they were uh, not just misguided, but heretics, uh, that this man Jesus, who claimed to be the Messiah and the Son of God, uh, was a blasphemer and someone whose memory should be snuffed out. So he actually was part of capturing uh, Jewish believers, uh, beating them, imprisoning uh, them. And we know from his later defense before King Agrippa, he admitted to be part of the death of many believers. So we read in Acts chapter 9, it's about three years after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, young, passionate Saul got authority from Gamaliel and the Sanhedrin to go north from Jerusalem, 160 miles to Damascus, because there were synagogues there all over the Roman world. Synagogues were local places of worship. The temple was in Jerusalem. That's where all the festivals were. But you'd come several times a year to that. But you would worship in your local synagogue, kind of like a local church. And he got authority to go to Damascus uh, to capture Jewish believers to beat them, to bind them, and drag them 160 miles back to Jerusalem where they would be at least put in prison and possibly killed. Well, as Saul was on this road to accomplish this passionate mission, a bright light came all around him and literally knocked him to the ground, stunning him so severely he was made blind. He was terrified. He cried out in a voice, who are you, Lord? Good question. The answer came back to him was the answer he did not expect. He said, I am Jesus who you are persecuting. You see, when Jesus so identifies with the church, when you persecute the church, you're persecuting its master and savior. Well, everything that Paul believed about Jesus suddenly was turned upside down. He was blind and helpless and told to keep going and that he would be told what to do when he goes to Damascus. He went to a house on Straight Street and there he was in total fast, meaning no food, no water for three days, which meant he would have been on the verge of death. Uh, God sent a man named Ananias, a Jew who'd become a believer, uh, to that house. He was a little afraid of doing it because of Paul, Saul's reputation, and he laid hands on him, scales fell from his eyes, and he told Saul that he was to be God's chosen instrument uh, to go out and proclaim the very Jesus that he'd been persecuting. You see, Saul, undoubtedly, in those three days of prayer, was saying, okay, Jesus, what do you want me to do? And those questions are the two most important questions you can ask. The first question is, who are you, Jesus? You need to know who Jesus is. That truth is more important than anything else in the world because if he is who he claims to be, the very Son of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, the one who will come and judge heaven and earth, then you need to know him. And then once you know him, the most important question you ask is, what do you want me to do? You see, that's what a slave does, a servant. That's why we call Jesus Lord. What do you want me to do? Uh, Jesus himself warned his own disciples and said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things I tell you to do? You see, obeying God and doing his will is not something for super Christians, for pastors, for a few people. It's for everyone who calls himself a Christ follower. And astoundingly, we find in Acts, the very next Sabbath, he went into the synagogues where he was going to go arrest Christians, Christ followers, and he proved from the Old Testament that Jesus was the Messiah. That's the word Christ. It means Messiah. A total 180 reversal. Only God can do something like that in a person's life. You see, Paul says, I'm a slave and apostle set apart for the gospel of God. He had the purpose to proclaim uh, that gospel, uh, to go out, set apart uh, the word there in the Greek. It's the same root word that the word Pharisee, uh, what we translate in English, because Pharisee was considered 
the separate ones, the holy ones. They considered themselves separate and better. And now Paul says, I was separate and better in my mind for this, but now I've been set apart, separated by God to do something completely different. Do you see the irony? The very people he hated, now he was the greatest proclaimer of Jesus Christ and proponent for Christianity to Jews and to Gentiles. Only God can make that kind of change in a person's life. Next, we find the source, the source in verse 2. It says, which promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Uh, where did Paul's message uh, come from? Is Christianity a new thing? No, it's not. It comes from the Old Testament. The source is, is from God. Uh, God revealed it. Uh, that word gospel, uh, the gospel revealed is literally good news. Gospel means good news. It's used 11 times in the book of Romans. Euangelion, uh, good words, is what it literally means in the Greek. And where that came from, another common term that Paul put new meaning into, is when Roman emperors uh, would go out in their chariots, uh, they would have a herald in front of them who would cry out, euangelion, euangelion, good news, good news, and he would announce that the emperor had a son, that the emperor had won a great victory, uh, that the emperor was going to open the games and bless the Roman people. Uh, so the emperor goes out in his chariot, and before him is a herald running in front of him yelling, good news, good news. And Paul says, now the emperor of the universe is sending me out to proclaim to the world good news. God does have a son. He did fight a war over sin and death, and he won. And you can be on the winning side. And he gives gifts of salvation to those who will believe. So Paul was sent to the entire Roman world uh, by God to declare for all to hear the good news for everyone. Not good news from a human ruler. Uh, we all could barely hear some good news in the fight with COVID-19 right now, couldn't we? But there's a far more important news, and that is how to be right with God. So who is this God revelation? Well, it's through his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus is his given name, which means salvation. And Christ is the translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, which means the anointed one. The Messiah was the long expected king of Israel who would come and set up a kingdom that would never end, that would rule the nations. And again, this is not a new thing. Uh, the Old Testament was Judaism, and the New Testament is not something different. It is the fulfillment of Judaism. Christianity is not a new religion. Those who say that could not be more wrong. Jesus is the fulfillment. He said, I have not come to destroy the law and the prophets, but to fulfill them. The gospel, the New Testament, can't be understood apart from the New Testament. The Old Testament is just a whole series of signs that point to Jesus Christ and the gospel. That's what Paul preached. Uh, he went around the Roman world and every city he went to, first he went to synagogues and it says, and he proved from the scriptures that Jesus Christ was, Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah and the Son of God. Died for our sins, resurrected from the dead, coming again in glory someday. Jesus himself said to the disciples in Luke 18, 31, See, we're going to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. Son of Man, a term he used for himself. Written by the prophets from Genesis to Malachi, Zechariah, Isaiah, all through the Psalms are filled with scriptures that point to him. The Apostle Paul later was imprisoned and for several years, and he had a trial before King Agrippa, and he was defending himself. And this is part of what he said in Acts 26. To this day, I've had help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both to great and small, listening, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Messiah, Christ, must suffer. And by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people, Jews, and to Gentiles. Do you hear that? saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses had said. Well, who is that subject? Well, we've already mentioned him. He's Jesus Christ. And Paul points out two things uh, about Jesus Christ here as an introduction. 
that he is a physical descendant of David because King David, the promise was to Abraham and then through David that someone from David's line would always reign as king. The Apostle Peter, who was one of the eyewitnesses of Christ and close friends, he wrote this in his letter, 1 Peter. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and subsequent glories. We don't have time to go into it, but there are over 300 specific prophecies about the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ that are all perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's descended from David according to the flesh. That is, this was not a, a ghost that appeared for a little while and left. This is fully human being, the heir, the Messiah, to David's throne. And also declared to be the Son of God. He wasn't made the Son of God. He already was the Son of God, fully God and fully human. But by his resurrection from the dead, by the spirit of holiness, it says that he's declared because Jesus' deity was largely hidden from human view in his life. But with his ascension into heaven, he now reigns in heaven. He is openly declared by the Father, the Son of God. And one day he will return to earth to judge all who have lived as King of kings and Lord of lords. You see, the good news of the gospel is not about a good man. It's about a God-man, Jesus Christ. And what's the scope of this salvation? Well, in 5 through 7, Paul says it's for all peoples. It's for everybody. Up until then, the Jews thought it was just good news for the Jews. Paul learned it was for everyone. He received a grace, he said, undeserved favor from God for the purpose of declaring the good news for all people, for the sake of his name, that is, for the glory of God. To all nations, the gospel's for everyone. I think of it this way. If you have a particular disease and someone in one country discovers a medicinal cure for that disease, you don't say that cure only belongs and will work in that one country because we're all humans. Any disease that is cured by medicine works for all humans, regardless of sex, ethnicity, race, language, or country. Well, the disease we have is sin, and there is one cure, God's salvation. And the purpose of this, he says, to bring about, that's purpose language, is the obedience of faith. Now, what does he mean by that, obedience of faith? i got to get a little grammarish on you here. It's two nouns put together in what's called a genitive construction. Uh, why is that important? Well, we'll see this throughout Romans. There are times where Paul puts two nouns together, and to understand the relationship between the two nouns is vital to understand the meaning of what's saying there and Romans in its entirety. It's not there's faith, and then some people are obedient. Uh, a way to more expansively say it is the obedience that comes from or results from faith. He's saying wherever there is genuine faith, there is always genuine obedience to God. We are saved by faith alone. We have no merit. We do not deserve it. But when we are saved, when we encounter the grace of God, it is a life-changing event that turns us into God-obeyers. Now, that's the process of sanctification, and it's a battle. Uh, we learn to obey God more and more over time. But it certainly means this. To have faith in Jesus Christ means that you are bowing uh, the knee to him in obedience, in worship. The basis of our faith made, being made justified uh, by God is entirely based on what God has done for us, not what we do for God. But when God has done that for us, when he has put his saving grace in our life, it transforms us. And we'll see that in Romans 5 through 8. That's why Paul proclaimed in Acts 17, 30, God commands everyone everywhere to repent. The initial act of faith is an act of obedience. That is, we hear his call to repent of our willfulness and rebellion and say, I was wrong. Like Paul said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Think of it as two sides of the same coin, or the theologian Karl Barth famously called it 
lightning and thunder. Lightning is faith and thunder is the obedience. When lightning strikes, the thunder is inevitable. When faith comes, obedience is inevitable. So my friends, Paul has uh, just flown through. I've flown through just the very pithy introduction of what he's given. He's giving us signposts. We'll see that in Romans. He'll mention something and then later develop it. We'll see all these themes develop. And lastly, he says in verse 7 that the Romans are dearly loved by God. Why? Because they've experienced God's grace and peace. When you experience God's saving grace and your sins are forgiven and you're united to God, it gives peace to your heart. You no longer have that spiritual anxiety, and you know that you are dearly loved by God. When we get to Romans chapter 8, uh, one of the greatest chapters in the entire Bible, uh, the magnificence of God's love and what he does and how he will never leave us or forsake us and how he's at work in our life should bring you to tears. It's one of the most important chapters to understand. So my friends, I want to ask you, do you have peace with God? Have you experienced his saving grace when his faith is given to you and you believe in him? Do you now want to obey God? See, there's only one cure for sin. Christianity is not one of many religions. There's one God, one means of salvation, Jesus Christ, and one response, faith in him, which produces obedience. We're made justified only by what God has done, but we receive it by faith with empty hands. Paul, when he wrote Romans, had spent 25 years proclaiming this uh, throughout the Roman world, the Eastern Roman world, uh, not merely to educate people, and that's not my purpose this morning, not merely to educate you, but to transform you, because it is God's word that changes us. Romans 10 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word. Well, it's when we believe and receive his grace, then we are transformed. See, the gospel takes dead people, spiritually dead, and makes them alive. It takes orphans and turns them into sons and daughters of God. It finds the lost, and then they are found. It takes the broken and makes us whole. It takes us in our hopelessness and gives us a certain glorious future. Have you bowed the knee of faith to Jesus Christ? Have you been made right with God because of what he has done for you? You can be accepted, forgiven, and dearly loved. Jesus said this in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He doesn't come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Friends, this is the good news for everyone. Is it your good news? Do you know him? You can write to us uh, through our website, Grace Point with an E, G R A C E P O I N T E dot org, on the contact form and say free book. Uh, there's a book that we will send you for free about the last week of Jesus' life and what it means to have a relationship with Him. I'm going to pray for all of us. Father, we thank you for filling all the promises of the Old Testament in Jesus Christ that we might be saved. We thank you that you can take a hater, a murderer, a persecutor like Paul. And by your sovereign grace, you turn him around. Saul didn't do anything to deserve that. You did it for him. And our salvation, we don't deserve it. We don't earn it. We receive it. Father, I pray for those who are listening right now that today would be the day they'd surrender being a rebel. They know what that is in their heart. They're living life on their own terms. But we need to surrender. But why wouldn't we? We can then have a living relationship with you, a future filled with hope purpose in life and healing to our heart. Lord, I pray that they would do that today. Say, Lord Jesus, I was wrong. I confess that. I'm sorry. I turn from that and I turn to you. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, crucified for me, buried and resurrected. And because of what you've done, I can be forgiven and live forever. I receive this in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you have prayed that prayer, you now have eternal life. That's not my words, that's Jesus Christ. Write us, we'd love to help you. And I hope to see you here next week as we continue our study in Romans. We'll look at chapter one, verses eight through 15. God bless you and have a great week.